Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us today. I want to start this morning with a, uh, a quote I found this morning that's attributed to the Buddha. Now, I haven't been able to track down the entire quote to find out what what uh, the source is, what what document it might be in, but I have <coughs> I have found enough of the quote attributed to the Buddha, the Buddha that uh, I do believe it is it is actually his words. We are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make the world. It is good to control them. And to master them brings happiness. But how subtle they are. How elusive. The task is to quieten them. And by ruling them to find happiness. I'm going to read that one more time. We are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts we make the world. It is good to control them. And to master them brings happiness. But how subtle they are. How elusive. The task is to quieten them. And by ruling them to find happiness. I thought that just fits so well in what in what we're talking about today. Of course, the title, if you read the email last night, the title is to switch off your autopilot. Switch off your autopilot. The, and the story that I used in the email, I'll just repeat for those who, who don't have it. I, I traveled a lot for, for work. I was, I was in the air, airports or hotels 40 to 50% of the time for, for several years. So things that, that dealt with aviation were were always kind of, they caught my eye. And, and at that time, I was also a pilot myself. So I paid attention to, to things that dealt with airplanes and aviation weather and all that. And I remember one morning getting up, and the story was that, that two pilots who had been flying a cargo plane on the night run to the West Coast, they fell asleep in the cockpit. And the plane past the airport that they were supposed to go to, and it just kept going. And it flew out to sea. I think it flew out to sea for a couple of hours before one of the pilots actually woke up and realized <laughs> where they were, which was not where they were supposed to be. And they turned the plane around. Of course, they went, they went back to the coast. And fortunately, they had enough fuel to, to make it all the way back to the coast without, <laughs> without running, out of, running out of fuel and having to ditch the plane in the ocean. And it's easy to understand how that happened. You know, we all, we all know that airplanes have these things called autopilots, which is nothing more than, than a, uh, a machine that is able to sense certain characteristics of the, uh, of the plane, the attitude, the speed, the altitude, those kind of things, the course and the heading. And it makes little adjustments. It makes little adjustments to, to keep the plane on those on those preset parameters, you know. So, so the pilot might lay in the course, <coughs> the direction that they want to fly in, the altitude that they want to be at, the speed they want the plane to fly at. And once that gets all set in and the, the plane is, at, is, is on that heading at that speed, at that, you know, those kind of things, the pilot turns on the autopilot. And the autopilot senses through its sensors, it senses the altitude, it senses the speed, it senses the direction, and it makes little adjustments to keep the plane on the heading it was assigned to. Now, there's no consciousness involved. Right? The autopilot doesn't think. It doesn't, it, it doesn't go through the same thought process a human pilot might do. You know, so a human pilot might look down at the... Uh, at the altimeter and say, oh, I'm too high, I need to, I need to bring it down a little bit. The autopilot just senses and responds. It senses and responds. Now there's a time where that's good. You see, there's a time where that is most helpful because 
particularly on long flights across the country, the autopilot can do a better job than the human pilot of keeping the plane flying smoother and, and steady and, and all of those things. And it relieves the human pilot of the, of the boredom of just, just trying to control the plane for all, all those hours. You know, if you, <laughs> you, remember, you remember the days before cars had cruise controls. My car still doesn't have cruise control. But you get on the highway and you, and you go for a drive of several hours long. And uh, w when, you, when you get to the rest area, you have to kind of shake your leg a little bit to get the blood going back in it. And maybe, maybe you squeeze your hands a little bit to get the blood flowing because it's tedious just holding on to the controls and, and controlling manually. So autopilot can be a good thing, you see, because it does things automatically that the, that the human pilots don't have to concern themselves with. But it can also do things that are not in, our, in the best interest. So obviously flying past the West Coast and heading out to the Pacific, that was not in the best interest of those pilots. See, there comes a time in, in the flight of the airplane, there comes a time when the pilot has to switch off the autopilot. The human has to exercise their responsibility. They must switch off autopilot and they must bring the plane in to land it. Now I realize that today they actually have systems on planes that will auto land, but still the pilot has to set those controls. They have to make those changes into the settings of the autopilot. They have to tell it to land the plane and then they have to monitor it and observe it. Make sure that the autopilot is doing what it's supposed to do. But even when the autopilot is flying the plane, the pilot in command is responsible. I remember that studying the, uh, the Federal Aviation Regulations, studying for the pilot's license. <laughs> there's, there's one line in there that just sums it up. It says, the pilot in command is responsible for the safe operation of the aircraft at all times. At all times. The buck stops right there at all times. Now that kind of reminds me a little bit <coughs> about where we are in our lives and in our spiritual growth. Dr. Holmes tells us, change your thinking, change your life. <clears throat> he also tells us that trained thought is more powerful than untrained thought. And he tells us more he tells us that as we are using that technique, the practice of spiritual mind treatment that he gave to us, that what happens is, is we discover that there's more beyond thought. It's not just a matter of thought. It's not just a matter of thinking. But there is something that responds to us according to our belief. And then we want to know that something, you see. We want to know what it is. We taste the meal. We want to meet the chef. What is it? What is it about us that there's this something in the universe that responds to us according to our belief? So we kind of get led. We kind of get led. Our <clears throat> our curiosity with the way life works kind of leads us into know why life works that way. What is beyond? So we start to think, well, you know, there's this power in the universe that responds to me according to our belief. And it, in Buddhism we have it. In the Old Testament we have, as you think and believe in your heart, so are you. And the Stoic philosophers tell us what the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. We have all of these different ideas from different teachings and different philosophies that are telling us that there is this something there is this something that works with us according to the way we think and believe, the way we think and believe. And this naturally leads us to try to understand what is thought, what is belief, what is mind, what is this thing called mind, what is consciousness, what is consciousness. In Zen Buddhism, <clears throat> 
it said that, that Zen is concerned with the nature of mind, the nature of mind. So we go back to go back to the <clears throat> the example of the autopilot in the airplane. Something has to set up the parameters for that autopilot. A human being has to input certain commands to the autopilot, where they have to upload a file <clears throat> that a computer generates and put it into the autopilot. But once that set of instructions is given to the autopilot, it faithfully carries them out. And if you, if you want to think about the law of mind, for lack of a better term, we call it, we'll call it the law of mind. If we want to think about this power that responds to us according to our belief, kind of think of it the same way. Right? The autopilot is impersonal. The autopilot is not going to say, well, well Jim, I, I like you. You're, you're a nice guy. And when you put this command in, in here, it's, it's really not going to take you where you want to go. It's going to take you on a different course. The autopilot just does exactly as it is told. So we live in this universe that responds to us according to our belief and does exactly, exactly what the sum total, the sum total of our thoughts, our beliefs, our emotions, our conscious thoughts, our subliminal thoughts, the thoughts that, that are below our level of consciousness, all of that together kind of gives this set of instructions to the power that responds to us according to our belief. It's like our autopilot. Now, of course, <coughs> this, this, <laughs> this autopilot of ours is always working. It never takes a day off. And it is always working on what we take time to consciously give it, as well as what is already in our subconscious mind or subliminal mind, if you want to call it that. When we were, when we were listening to Carl Jung a couple months ago, you know, he said, very interesting thing about human beings is that the ego cannot know the self. And that made me stop and wonder because up until that time, my, my understanding of the ego was the self, but it's not. The ego is the conscious self, but there is more to the, the total self than what is just conscious. There is a great deal of us that operates below our level of conscious awareness. Jung called it sub subconscious and he called it subliminal. And he said most of what we do, most of the motivations in our life are driven by impulses that come to us from that subliminal, subconscious mind. Dr. Holmes called it race consciousness. Carl Jung called it collective unconscious. But there is a part of us that is unknown to the ego. It is un unknown, but not unknowable. It can be known through its symbols, through its actions. But we don't know it directly. So what we want to consider then is that <clears throat> we are kind of like the airplane in that we have this system, this autopilot system, that works on our behalf. But it works according to the, to the instructions that it's given. And those instructions include our conscious thought as well as that which is in our subconscious mind or subliminal mind. And our life, our world, is, as the Buddha said in the opening, but, but our experience of this world, the circumstances in our life, they depend on the instructions that we are given to that autopilot. To that, to that impersonal law. Like the impersonal autopilot will fly that plane right out to sea until somebody gives it a different command. The impersonal law will keep bringing to us exactly, exactly the outpicturing of the instructions that we have given to it until and unless we change them. Change your thinking, change your life. But in order to change your thinking, you must be aware 
of what you are thinking. You must be aware of what you are thinking, both at a, <coughs> at a conscious level and a subconscious level. You must be aware of what you are putting into your subconscious. You must be aware of what, what programming, if you want to call it that, that you are giving to yourself. So this is why, <coughs> this is why, why mindfulness, this is why awareness, this is why spiritual practice to deliberately condition your mind, if you want to call it conditioning your mind, this is why these things are so important. And we want to consider now how much of our life, how much, how much time, percentage of time in our life are we really, truly, consciously aware of the activity of thought, of the activity that's going on within us, of not only, not only the activity of thought, but the activity of the senses, the five senses, what kind of input are we getting, what are our feelings? What are we feeling right now? What are our emotions right now? See, we are made up, we are complex beings. We are made up of all of these different aspects. And this, this thing that we call <laughs> our consciousness, or perhaps the thing that we can call the, the self, the total self, the consciousness plus the unconsciousness, is constantly being stimulated by all of these different things. And this stimulation is causing action and reaction. And we are being driven and motivated by impulses that we barely understand. This is why Dr. Holmes told us, you know, you'll never you'll never usually be able if you if you go back and you say, well, gee, you know, I had a I had a certain condition, I got a sore knee or I got a sore back or I have a certain condition. What was I thinking that caused that condition? And I realize that there are little books that you can get that say, oh, a sore back, well, that's lack of support. And that may or may be so. But it's not, it's not so much that there's going to be an absolute one-to-one -one cause and effect. But it's the totality, this kind of the stew, I call it, the stew of our consciousness. That's what this law is acting upon. So Dr. Holmes said, you know, we are driven by impulses we barely understand. We have all sorts of things going on inside this, this activity that we call consciousness. Things that we know about, things that we don't know about, and all of this is kind of percolating and outpicturing in our lives. So what do we do? See, what do we do? We are operating most of the time in our lives, I would say most of us are operating most of the time on autopilot. We are not consciously thinking about what we are doing. <clears throat> we are not consciously thinking about what we are feeling. We are not consciously aware of why we are thinking or feeling those things. And yet they rule our lives. They rule our lives. And I, I'll just give you a, a, a simple example. You know, we get so busy. You get up in the morning, you turn on the coffee pot, you listen to the news, you get dressed, you go to work, and you run out and you get in the car, you know, and, and you're starting down the road and you say, now, did I turn the coffee pot off? I don't remember. Did I turn the stove off? I don't remember, you know. In the old days, you had to turn around, go back home and Go back in the house and make sure you turned everything off. These days now they have smart appliances that connect to your phones <laughs> so you can turn off all the stuff you forgot to turn off. When you left the house, you can turn them off from your phone while you're driving down the road. <coughs> but we are not consciously aware. See, we, we do things from habit and we are not consciously aware. And we must become consciously aware. I think I told you uh, last year or so <clears throat> when I was studying the memory courses, you know, how to, you can memorize anything. And one of the uh, experts, Harry Lorraine, uh, Harry Lorraine and Jerry Lucas wrote a book called The Memory Book. And in it, Harry Lorraine says, the reason we don't remember things is because we're not originally aware of them in the first place. Somebody tells us a name and, you know, comes in and goes out. 
we don't particularly pay attention. So what the memory techniques force us to do is to become originally aware. Somebody tells us their name, we, we try to think of an image that goes with that name, a picture, and we try to attach that picture to some prominent feature on that person's face. The next time we see that face, our mind remembers that picture and, and we remember the name. Original awareness. So this is what we were talking about here, original awareness. So sometimes people, as I say, will have this pain and they will say, well, you know, I wasn't thinking about getting a pain in my knee. Why did I get a pain in my knee? Excuse me while I get a drink of water. <clears throat> and it's true, we weren't thinking about getting a pain in our knee, but nevertheless, we got a pain in our knee. But the better question is, well, what were you thinking? Were you deliberately thinking anything? And I think for many of us, the answer to that is, well, no, we get busy, we go about our day, you know, we we go to work, we get, we answer the phone, we start checking emails, customers call in, and, and we're just entangled in the day. Entangled is a good word for it. We are entangled because we are being driven by events. One thing leads us to another, that leads us to another, that leads us to another. <coughs> and not only are we not necessarily deliberately doing something, but we are not aware of what we are doing. We're not even aware of what it is that we are doing. So it seems sometimes, it seems that, that we are so caught up in this, in this mode that I call running on autopilot, that it would be impossible to break it. It seems to us then that we are victims of our own thoughts. We, we don't know how to change them. We don't know how to stop them. They are there, and once they are there, we must act out upon them. We must do something with them. You hear, you hear this in the, in the vernacular all the time. You will hear people in power say, well, they had no choice but to, to do something. They had no choice but to, to lead the nation to war. They had no choice but to pass this bill. They had no choice. And of course, that's not true. That's not true. And usually years later we find out, well, yeah, they had a choice, but they didn't tell us about that because they wanted us to support whatever decision they had already made. Even, even doesn't have to be at the level of, of a leader or a politician. Even at the level of day-to-day of -day life, you know, people will say, well, I had no choice but to get angry, or I had no choice but to, but to do this or do that. And when I hear that, when I, when I hear that, what I'm hearing is people saying they don't know how to control their thoughts. Remember the opening text? It's good to control our thoughts, to quiet them, to experience the happiness. So we want, to re we want to think of a couple things here. First of all is, is that many of the habits of thinking, the autopilot, many of those things we developed without even deliberately trying to develop them. <coughs> you know, now that we're all grown up <laughs> and we've got, we've got all of these bad habits, if we want to break them, uh, we don't even know where they came from. But if we want to develop a new habit, oh my goodness, is that a chore? You know, scientists tell us that if you do if you do something for 21 days, you'll develop a new habit. So just try doing something for 21 days. You know, and you have to you have to work at it. You have to build yourself a little a little spreadsheet or put tick marks on your calendar. Or you have to remind yourself. You have to consciously bring yourself to this thing to do it for 21 days. Back in the days when I was selling, um, Og Mandino wrote a book, uh, The Greatest Salesman in the World. <clears throat> and he laid the book out as it was a, a series of uh, scrolls that were hidden in a cave. And this young boy found these scrolls. And each one contained a great secret of success in it. And, he, you know, he had, he had a chapter for each scroll. And what you were supposed to do is you were supposed to get up every morning 
and read whatever whatever scroll you were working on, whatever aspect of being a, a great salesperson, you were supposed to read that for 21 days. And then you started on the next chapter. So you didn't just read the book and go through it. You read a chapter. You stayed with it for 21 days. You read the next chapter. You stayed with the scroll for 21 days. Because it takes 21 days to build a new habit. <coughs> That's if we're doing it deliberately, you see. But how many of the habits that we have developed, the habitual ways of thinking, have we developed that <coughs> we didn't consciously choose? Excuse me, as Wendy gave us from Dr. Wayne Dyer, uh, Dwyer in the opening quote, you know, we practiced them, we did them over and over, but we may not have done it consciously. We may not have done it consciously. So, so like the autopilot on the plane, <coughs> excuse me, which, which is useful because it frees the, the pilots up to do other things, to monitor other systems, to, to look at gauges and all, all of that. Doing things automatically also frees us up, right? There's an advantage to it. It's not a complete disadvantage. <coughs> Excuse me, the pollen, the pollen is, is really getting to me this morning. So we need to learn how to do something, drive a car, for example. And as we are learning, you know, we are going from unconscious incompetence to, to conscious competence, and then we move to unconscious competence. While we are learning and very, very busy, we're thinking about all kinds of things, we're learning all things, we're getting feedback and input, we're making mistakes, we're correcting mistakes, until one day it all comes together. <coughs> and then we just get in the car and zip down the road, drop the top on the convertible, <coughs> crank up the 8-track, you know, hair blowing on our breeze, and we're not thinking about any of that anymore. Well, while we are learning it, we are repeating. We are, we are deliberately going through this process. But many of the things that we have learned, many of the things that we believe, many of the thought processes, we, we absorbed when we were tiny. I mean, watching a baby grow is just amazing. Just amazing. In a year's time, you know, when they come into the world, all they can do is lay there. They can't even roll themselves over, you know. All they can do is lay there and maybe make a sound of distress so that, uh, that someone else would come and help them. But by a year's time, you know, they're starting to toddle all over the place, finding things, putting things in their mouth, <laughs> pulling a cat's tail, <coughs> into, into all kinds of stuff, starting to learn how to talk. Learning, the, learning vocabulary, learning the names for all kinds of things. And they're not doing that consciously. They're not doing it like you and I when we went to school and we learned the multi multiplication tables through rote by repeating them over and over again. They just kind of absorb it. So many of, the, many of the things that we believe, many of the thoughts that we have, we did not consciously develop. We just kind of absorb them. We have them, and we are not even aware that we have them. And yet, they rule our lives. So, in, in Buddhism, there's something called the, the, the chain of dependent origination. I believe that's what it's called. But the idea is, is this. We, we have six senses. We have the five physical senses, and then we have kind of a, <coughs> a cognitive sense, which you, I might say would include thoughts and feelings and emotions. <coughs> you want, might want to take emotions separately. I don't know. But we have all of these different inputs. We have all of these different things that come, come to us. And when they come to us, the next, the next thing that happens is a feeling arises. And 
and in in this teaching in the Buddhist teaching it's uh, pleasant unpleasant neutral how do you feel about that pleasant unpleasant neutral you know show somebody a bowl of ice cream pleasant unpleasant neutral well you know for some people it's going to be pleasant for other people not pleasant maybe <clears throat> maybe they don't like ice cream maybe they're lactose intolerant who knows but once that feeling arises <clears throat> See, then it starts to lead to, to action. And the thought is, if it's pleasant, we want to cling to it. We want more of it. How are we going to, <laughs> how are we going to get, you're watching TV and the commercial comes on and the, the bowl of your favorite ice cream comes on and the first thing it goes, ooh, do we have any of that in the freezer? Do I need to go to the store? <clears throat> we, start to, we start to move towards action, to attachment. To, to clinging, to having it. Or if it's unpleasant, we try to avert. <clears throat> we try to move away from it. And then, and then those things lead to other things and lead to other things and lead to other things. And what happens is we tend to repeat that same pattern over and over and over again. Because many of those patterns we learned without conscious thought. You know? <clears throat> remember one time um, reading a book about, about developing habits, and it was, it was using sports as an example. And it said, you know, you can, for example, to play golf, <coughs> you can go to the, to the range and you can pay a golf pro and you can take lessons. And you can learn how to hold a club and hit the ball and all those kind of things. Or you can just go to the range and get a set of clubs and a bucket of balls and you can hit the balls. and you will, learn, you will learn how to hit the ball. You will learn pretty much how to play golf on your own. And the illustration said the difference between the two is, is, that, is that when you teach yourself how to do it, you will adopt some bad habits. You will learn things incorrectly. And you will be able to play, but you will reach a plateau where you can't get any better. And then what you have to do is, is you have to go back and you have to see the pro. And it's going to cost you more because not only is the pro teaching you how to do it properly, but you have to unlearn all of the bad habits that you taught yourself. All of the bad habits that you taught yourself. <clears throat> so as, as we go through life then, we come to the realization that the greatest asset that we have is our minds, our ability to choose our thoughts. Right? Dr. Holmes said this, the greatest discovery that, that human beings made was that they could think. But not only that we could think, but that we could choose our thoughts. <clears throat> so we look at a world around us and we look at our own lives and we see that most of the time we do not exercise that dominion over our thoughts. Something happens, it, it triggers a feeling, it triggers, it triggers an action, we do this, we do that, we do the other thing. The next day it happens again and we do it and we do it and we do it and we do it. So in, in learning how to break habits, you must become consciously aware. <coughs> you must become consciously aware of what it is that you are doing. So going back to the example of learning how to play golf, you go to the pro and the pro says, Show me how you hold your club. Show me, show me your stance. Show me your backswing. Show me your downswing. You know? And the pro knows what to look for. The pro can see the, the student as they engage in their bad habits. And they'll stop you. Why are you holding the club this way? You know? Why are you standing with your feet where they are? Did you start your back, your downswing, by bringing your, by rotating your hips, and all these different things that they learn how to, to do, to observe us, right? This, to me, this is the benefit of a coach. A coach can observe you doing things that you can't catch yourself doing. <clears throat> you can become aware of them, and then you can deliberately change them. You can deliberately change them. Now, in our life, you and I are the only ones who can observe our thinking. <clears throat> I can't see your thoughts. I can, I can perhaps see the outpicturing of your thoughts. 
in your life, you know, are you happy, are you not happy, all those kind of things. <clears throat> but I can't hear the voices in your head. You can't hear the voices in my head or see the pictures in your head if you think in pictures. You are the only one that can do that. No one else can do that for you. Our, our growth then, our spiritual growth, requires us, requires us to become aware. Awareness, simple awareness. So <clears throat> you might want to think of a couple aspects of our growth. Right? One is we can become aware of what's going on in our minds. The monkey mind, we can see the, the, the scatteredness of our brains. We can see how our mind... So in, <clears throat> in one aspect of uh, one school of Buddhism, they use the example of a monkey that is, is captured in the forest and brought into a house and locked into the house. And the monkey was sedated, so it was asleep. And as it comes to consciousness, it's in this house. And there are five windows in the house, which represent the five senses. And the monkey fleets from window to window to window to window, just constantly looking out there, see? And eventually it just kind of settles in and it gets used to the fact that it's in the house. We have all of these different inputs coming in through the five senses, and our mind is like that monkey that jumps from here to here to here to here. And we get so used to it, we get so accustomed to it, that we think that that's normal. <coughs> Not only do we think that it's normal, we think that that's the only way it is. We never even stop to think about what's going on. But if we are to change our lives, first we must become aware of that. We must become aware of those things. Once we become like like breaking a, a habit with your golf swing, once we become aware, then we can start to deliberately change. Now we can we can start to deliberately change. I mean you you can start to practice putting what you want into mind. You should be doing that. <coughs> but you also must become aware of all of this activity that is taking place in your autopilot. We become aware, then we can quiet it down. We can quiet it, remember? And what we say is when it, when it starts to quiet down, we start to see beyond the thoughts. And then at some point, we may actually be able to still the thoughts, to bring them to a pause. <coughs> so for today, we're, we're not going to worry about bringing them to a pause. That, that may be a subject for another time for sure but we want to be committed to this idea that we are the only ones who can become aware <clears throat> and for right now just awareness just awareness because what the Buddha discovered is that this chain of, of causation of one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing it can be broken it's like a chain and in, in, in any chain the weakest link is the weakest point of the chain. Doesn't matter where in the chain that is, if that link gives way, the entire chain gives way. <clears throat> so what the Buddha came to realize was that we, through our senses, we start to, to generate a feeling. And then that feeling generates a reaction. But if we are aware, if we are aware of that feeling as it comes up, if we are aware of what we are seeing and how we are starting to react to it, that in that very act of becoming aware, we now have a choice. We now have a choice. See, before we weren't exercising our choice, the autopilot was was flying the plane for us. We saw something pleasant. We felt pleasant. We wanted more of it. We started to plan how we were going to get more of it. All those kind of things. But now, see now, if we start to become aware, we can say, oh, there's a pleasant feeling. 
that's it. That's it. We don't have to cling to it. We don't have to grasp for it. We don't have to start planning what we're going to do. We can if we want. I mean, it might, might be a good thing. You, know, you might see a, an advertisement for milk and you go, ooh, we're out of milk. I need to get milk on the way home. Where am I going to stop for milk? Nothing wrong with that. But most of what's going on, particularly with advertising, most of what's going on is happening at a level below our conscious awareness. So what we want to consider for today is something that we talked about a while ago, is mindfulness. What's going on right now? Remember, there's a little app you can put on your phone, the bell rings at whatever interval you set, and when that bell goes off. What's going on right now? What's going on in my body? Aches and pains? comfortable. What's going on in my mind? Is it scattered? Is it racing? Is it calm? Is it peaceful? What's going on in my emotions? Am I optimistic? Am I fearful? Am I neutral? We used to call them little check-ins. We used to actually do this in, in the, before a conference would start, a meeting would start at work. We'd ask people to kind of get in touch with where they were. <coughs> because many times people would come into a meeting and bring in all of the garbage from their last meeting with them. Or all of the garbage from their next meeting was still was with them. They were sitting in this meeting thinking about that one, thinking about the last one, but they weren't present. We want to be fully present here now. Fully present here now. Our life is our laboratory. You see, we, we can be aware we can be aware we don't we don't need to make 24 hours a day seven days a week the goal right now but it can certainly <clears throat> at some point in our growth be that way when you eat are you eating are you mindful when you are eating you can do that we all have to eat <clears throat> but typically we eat and we're watching the TV or we're reading the newspaper or we're doing other things can we eat when we're eating? Remember, remember the Zen saying, Zen is, is eating when you're eating, walking when you're walking, sleeping when you're sleeping. Can you be present in that moment? Can you be present in that moment? Can you listen mindfully? <clears throat> How many times we are engaged in a conversation with someone and we're not really listening to them. We're thinking about what we're going to say next. Can we just sit and listen and be with someone? And Wendy and I were talking about this before the service started. <clears throat> Can we go out and look at the trees and the birds and the grass and the animals? And can we see the sacredness that's in them? the miracle that they represent, the miracle of life. And here's the importance of this. Here's the importance I'd like to leave you with this. You have the ability to do it. You have the responsibility to do it. You have the accountability to do it. <coughs> Unless and until you take your life off of autopilot, and begin to exercise your dominion, everything is going to continue to repeat over and over and over and over again. We have to break out of this cycle. Our spiritual growth, our spiritual maturity says, it's time for me to switch off the autopilot. It's time for me to be responsible for the safe operation of my life at all times for the growth of my soul. <clears throat> the miracle is already here, but we don't see it. The kingdom is already here all around us, but we don't see it because our minds are stuck on autopilot. Reliving the past, recreating the past over and over and over and over. 
take your time, make your time to just practice awareness. Be aware of breath. Be aware of some sound. You know, we had a... <coughs> Could still just barely hear it. You might not hear it on the on the tape, but there's there's an owl not too far from here, which is surprising. They're usually not active in the daytime. Just that beautiful little sound. Can you find something to just stay with? Just stay with. During the day, can you can you find a way to be more aware? Can you set a meditation bell? on your phone? Can you find a way to be deliberately aware? What am I doing now? What am I feeling now? What am I thinking now? <clears throat> if we start to become angry with someone, can we be aware that anger is there? <laughs> Instead of just getting angry and yelling at them, blowing a horn, writing them a letter, telling them another thing. Don't be driven, don't be driven by these impulses. Be aware, just be aware. And in that moment, in that moment of awareness, recognize that you have not only a choice, but a responsibility. How do you want to live your life? How do you want to grow? I think we must come to realize that this thing that we call spiritual growth <coughs> is a growth in consciousness. First, we have to learn how mind works. We have to be able to tame it. Then we can quieten it. And then we can move beyond it. <coughs> because our mind is only a tool. It is only a tool that we are going to use to get beyond mind. But it's like a boat. If you're, if you're out in the middle of the ocean and you're in a boat, even if it's a leaky boat, even if it doesn't work entirely properly, it's the only boat you got. You have to figure out how to work with it to get back to shore. This thing that you call your mind and your consciousness is your leaky boat. But you can fix it. In terms of you can, you can mend it well enough to get back to shore. And when you have arrived at the proper point, you be able to move beyond mind to that which is next. But for now, switch off your autopilot. <clears throat> switch off your autopilot. Grab the controls. You are the only thinker in your universe. Act accordingly. And so it is. <clears throat> so we're, gonna, we're going to close with a closing treatment today again for awareness. There is only one life and it is perfect awareness. It is perfect knowingness. It is perfect stillness. It is all powerful. It is all presence. It has created us out of itself, and it has given us the faculty of awareness. We are aware at this moment of the air on our skin, of the air moving through our nostrils, of the smells, of the tastes, of the sounds all around us, of the sights in our eyes, even though they may be closed. We are aware now of how we are feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, indifferent. We are aware of movement that is trying to begin
and we simply pause right there. We simply be still in a moment of awareness. We are in the moment. We accept then that what we are doing right now is laying a course into our autopilot, into the law of mind. We are giving it the direction to produce within us a greater degree of awareness as we eat, as we listen, as we walk in nature. Our entire being is alive with awareness. We remind ourselves frequently throughout the day, be aware, be aware. Be aware. As we become aware of things we wish were not there, we simply release them. Dissolve them into the nothingness from which they came and replace them. If we become aware of fear, we release it and replace it with love. We are grateful for this opportunity to be together this morning, to remind ourselves that we have the ability and the responsibility and the accountability of learning more of how mind works. Of controlling our thoughts. <clears throat> of quieting our minds. And experiencing true happiness. We are grateful to know that we are not alone in this as there is a power in the universe that responds to us according to our belief and this word is our belief. that these changes are already taking place within us. We release this treatment to that perfect law, knowing so certainly it is done, that we say together, <clears throat> and so it is. Alrighty then. Um, so, tomorrow night, 7.30 p.m. on the Zoom bridge, we are discussing how to live richly, the chapter in <coughs> Raymond Charles Barker's book, the power of decision. And his book is very much in line with what we're talking about today. A new you, a new experience, a new life requires a new decision. Do you want to keep repeating the old stuff over and over and over again? Or do you want to live life differently, perhaps more fully? It's your choice. No one else is going to make it for you. No one else can make it for you. You're the only one that can do it and you are capable. And so it is. Have a beautiful week, everyone.